Uh, so if you have a Bible with me, please turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, and we'll look together at verses 1 through to 14. Jeremiah 29, verses 1 to 14. These are the words of God to us. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiada and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem and the craftsmen, the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, it said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Well, it's great to be back in Gisborne after a few days away in Wellington at the General Assembly. Uh, but one of the best things about the Assembly is listening to the teaching from different people. And uh, we got to listen this year to a guy called Dr. Something Gomez, I can't remember his first name. And um, this guy kind of oversees uh, the 20 million members of the World Reform Fellowship and sort of travels all over the world teaching the gospel. Um, so I listened to his teaching and I thought, you know what, that's going to be a good message to bring to my congregation. And so I've not stolen it from him, I've just kind of taken some of the big ideas and made it my own and uh, brought it back to you guys. But just the word of acknowledgement there at the start. Well, I'm sure you've probably noticed if you go on social media or if you watch the news or anything like that, it's very clear, isn't it, that in these days we find ourselves in, people's hearts are failing them for fear. Fear is the environment of the news, of the mainstream media, of social media. It's fear, isn't it? You see it on everybody's faces. You see people experiencing all kinds of different what-ifs. People's hearts failing them for fear. If you've kept your eyes open in the last 10 years, you'll probably notice the world is quite different to what it was even 10 years ago, isn't it? Culturally, spiritually, economically, things are changing and the attitude is fear you see it in the world in the social media you even see it in the church people are asking the question what is the world coming to are we even going to be able to meet together in a few years is persecution just around the corner and there's great fear in the world there's even fear in the people of God well, as we come to our passage this morning we see that Fearful circumstances have always been the lot for the people of God. And we come to another fearful time in the scriptures, the time of the exile. At the time when the enemies of God grew so powerful and the people of God grew so weak that they were able to be captured by their enemies 
for 70 years and taken to Babylon. It was a time when there were strong enemies and a weak people of God. And be sure of this, people's hearts in that time were also failing them for fear. Well, it's into this space that the prophet Jeremiah comes. He often gets a bit of a bad rap as being the weeping prophet. He often has messages of harsh judgment and lots of messages of damnation and bad things. And but he also spoke words of comfort and of hope because he is speaking on behalf of God. And so into this really dark situation which Jeremiah is prophesying into, God wants to encourage his people. He wants to acknowledge the situation for them, what's going on in their lives, what's going on in their time. And to give them hope and encouragement that he has it all under control. And even though these are ancient words written to an ancient people, they're still just as relevant to us as the people of God today. God is still on the throne, he's still sovereign. And we can still take these words of encouragement for ourselves today. And because all the promises of God find their amen in Jesus Christ, aren't they? And so we'll come to an ancient passage, but it's full of very modern wisdom for you and for me. So I've got three points for us this morning, and they all begin with, all begin with the letter P. How about that? Three P's for you to remember. At first, we're going to see in our passage together a people in exile. Considering the reality of where Israel finds itself in and where we find ourselves in as well. Secondly, we'll see a purpose in exile. How does God want us to respond to the times in which we live? And thirdly, we'll see a promise in exile. What are the promises that God gives to strengthen and ballast us as we face a hostile world together as the church? So a people in exile, a purpose in exile, and a promise in exile. And it's my prayer this morning that we'd understand the times we live in are not so different from our passage, and yet God remains the same. The encouragements of, of yesterday are the encouragements of today as well. I pray that we'd all be encouraged by this message here this morning. So with that as a little bit of an introduction, let's come together and consider a people in exile. A people in exile. So usually as you come to the Bible, as you come to a letter, you know, at the end of our letters we say, from Luke or from John or from whoever, when the Bible, they write their name at the start, which is actually a better idea, isn't it? Because you might be thinking, who's this from? If you didn't know their email address. It says in verse 1, These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem. Who was Jeremiah? Well, it says that he was a prophet. You can read about his commissioning in Jeremiah chapter 1. He's only a young man, but the Lord comes to him. He gives him several visions. And he says, you're to prophesy to my people. At the time when Jeremiah was writing, uh, the northern kingdom of, of, um, of Israel had been already been taken into captivity by the Assyrians. Um, they'd suffered immensely at their hands. Isaiah had warned them about these things over and over and over again. And they'd ignored Isaiah and been captured. And at this time, the southern kingdom of Judah were thinking, well, we must really be God's people because we're still here in the land. And Jeremiah's come to tell them, you're not actually all that. You're in danger of exile yourselves as well. You guys are sinning just the same as the northern kingdom. And judgment is on its way. And so Jeremiah came and he was like a dagger in their sides. He was just warning them again and again and again, judgment is coming, judgment is coming. He looked them in the eye and he said, you've committed two evils, you've forsaken the fountain of living waters, God himself, and you've got these broken cisterns which you think are going to satisfy you, but they can't do anything for you at all. It's no wonder they didn't like him very much, is it? It's no wonder they threw him down the well when he was always dissing them, always calling them to account and yet Jeremiah was an accurate prophet it wasn't like one of these men you see on the television making predictions and none of them come come true or I see the person at the back I think you've got a, a gammy leg no he made accurate predictions 
Jeremiah 1.15, he says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. I will bring them against this, this, against, the, against this land, against its inhabitants, and against all the surrounding nations. He passed on God's message and he said, Judgment's coming from the north. The Babylonians are going to come south and take you and your families away. He said, behold, again, Jeremiah 6, this was another one of his predictions. He says, behold, a people comes from the north, a great nation and many kings. They will seize your wealth and your treasures and plunder them. In that day, declares the Lord, courage shall fail, both king and officials and priests shall be dismayed and the prophets astonished. So Jeremiah was the only faithful prophet around. Everyone else was saying it's going to be sweet as there's going, there isn't going to be an exile. You don't need to listen to Jeremiah. He's got depression. You don't want to listen to his bad words. Hear what we're saying to you. Everything's going to be fine. But what happened? Second Kings chapter 25, it says, In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came to Jerusalem and besieged it. It was the first part of the exile. There was a second part on, in Zedekiah's reign and there was a third part as well. It happened exactly how Jeremiah predicted. And if you've ever been to England, you can go to the British Museum, you can see all the relics from this time, all the different carvings and this sort of thing. And they have a whole section on the exile. So we know these things were true. So in the first part of the exile, Daniel's taken away. Ezekiel's taken away, the young men from the courts are taken away, the officials. In the second part of the exile, basically everyone else. In the third part, a few remaining, but there were some left in Jerusalem, and that included Jeremiah. So he's in that tiny, tiny minority who God left in the land. But even though he was in the land, he sent letters, he sent postcards, he was a persistent prophet. And we have one of his letters here to the exiles who were in Nebuchadnezzar's regime. Even there, they can't escape the watch of Jeremiah. It's a very fearful minister of the gospel, isn't it? Even, even though he's miles away, he still found a way to contact them and bring them the word of the Lord. And so he writes to the surviving elders of the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people Nebuchadnezzar has taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It's a message for all of Israel wasn't just for a select few, it was for everybody in the land. You get a little bit more information in verses two and three about the time of the letter. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent, it was sent by the hand of Elash to the son of Shaphan and Gemariah, the son of Hilkah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So this is Joram the third siege when he's writing his letter. Almost everybody is gone now. They can't say, it's not for me, it's just Daniel and the gang, it's just Ezekiel and the gang, it's just these guys. Almost everyone has been taken. So let's imagine we're all Israel together, we've been captured now, we're in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, it's a beautiful city with beautiful food. We're going along okay. Some of us have settled right down. Some of us have taken Babylonian wives for ourselves. And then there's an announcement. We've got a letter from Jeremiah. They think, oh no, what's he gonna say? He never has anything good to say to us. He's always tearing us to shreds. And some people said, no thanks. I don't wanna listen to what he's talking about. People had begun to enjoy the city of Babylon, but others, others really wanted to go home. Others wanted to serve God. Others wanted to be back in the land. So the letter comes, what's he going to say? I told you, sir. I told you this would happen. Well, no, not at all. He's passing on God's message and God is a bit more patient and gracious than we might be. He wants to remind his people that even though they've been captured by these human kings, even though everything's going wrong, even though they're surrounded by hostile pagan forces who are more powerful than they are, God is still on the throne. Take a look with me at verse 4 of what the Lord reminds them of. What's the letter say? It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, 
Who who sent the people into exile according to this verse? It was God, wasn't it? It says, to all the people that I sent into exile. He's still in control. It looked like Nebuchadnezzar was doing it with his hooks and his, and his armies. But God said, actually, I sent you to Babylon. No one else, me. If, if, if I wanted you still in the land, then that's where you'd be. I sent you to Babylon. And that's a message for us here today as well this morning, isn't it? Because we too are far from home. I don't mean just me, who's, you know, I'm from England, obviously it's miles away, it's about as far as you can go. No, all of you, if you're a Christian, or even if you're not a believer, you are far from your original home. You are in exile. Or did you walk with God in the coolness of the day this morning in the Garden of Eden? No, none of us did. All of us are in exile, aren't we? We're spiritually far from God at least geographically far from him at the very least. We are exiles. How does Peter introduce his letter? First Peter, we've nearly finished the book now on Thursday nights. He says, to those who are elect exiles. You know, this morning, if you're in church, if you're a Christian, then you are an elect exile. You've been chosen by God to be here in Gisborne now for such a time as this. You might wish you were born in the Puritan period of all the great thinkers. You might wish you'd been born in the Victorian times so you'd have a cool hat. But you're born here and now in Gisborne. You are an alien, a stranger, a pilgrim. You are in exile and you've been placed by God in in this part of the exile for such a time as this. You know If we just take it from a human perspective, we think, here we are, we're far from God, the culture's pressing in on us, they're hating us, everyone's starting to hate Christianity now. We could become really discouraged, couldn't we? We could become despairing, but here God reminds us, I put you in exile. I've put you exactly where I want you to be. Because there's still work to be done, even in the enemy's territory wants to lift our perspective heavenward. He's still on the throne. The scroll of the Lamb hasn't fully finished yet, has it? He hasn't wrapped up this world. There's still things for us to do here where we are placed. His story hasn't finished yet. Here we are in 2024. So you say, okay, Luke, I get that. We're far from home. We're in enemy territory. And what is it we should be doing now? How should we live our life in the enemy's camp here on earth? It's a good question, isn't it? And we'll see the answer in our second point. We've seen a people in exile, but now let's look together at a purpose in exile. A purpose in exile. So even now, uh, uh, you know, true persecution hasn't come to New Zealand and already many people are very discouraged to be a Christian today, aren't they? If you're honest, I am sometimes, I'm sure you are as well. It's not easy to keep moving forward. And the children of Israel, they struggled with the same thing, didn't they? Do you remember that famous psalm? I know you're going to be singing it in your head when I read it. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon. I've heard someone sing it actually once when I quoted it. It could have been Peter, I'm not sure. It says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Complete discouragement, wasn't it? They weren't willing to sing the psalms to God anymore. They said, no, hang those instruments up. We're in depressed mode now. And we feel the same sometimes as well, don't we? So how do we do it? How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How can we learn to sing and to be God's people in exile? Well, here's some super countercultural advice for you, which God gives. Look with me at verses five to seven. It says, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage 
so that they may bear daughters and sons, multiply there, and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And there's heaps to unpack there, I will do in a minute, but let's ask a question, why is it that God has to state the obvious here? These are pretty basic things which are in his word. Why does he have to come with some, it sounds like pretty basic sort of advice. Well, in order to understand that, you have to understand what was happening when Jeremiah was prophesying. Jeremiah was sending his letters, some of them full of judgment, some of them full of grace. And there were other prophets in the land who spoke against Jeremiah. From the world side, you had men like Ashpenaz. Do you remember Ashpenaz from the book of Daniel? He would train the young men cut their genitals off and give them Babylonian names and, and give them Babylonian food and say, now you're Babylonian. And men like Ashpenaz would say, you need to merge with us. I want Israel men to marry Babylonian ladies and vice versa. We need to be one people, was the cry of the Babylonians. So don't worry about all your differences, all your weird Jewish stuff, that's finished now. It's all finished. Look where you are. Look where your God's brought you. We are to be one people together. There needs to be no distinction at all. Compromise, compromise, compromise. That's what was being preached on the one hand. And, and then right on the other side of the, spectrum, of the spectrum, you had your staunch Israelites. You can imagine the guys of the Long Platz, Orthodox Jews, staunch. They love the God of Israel but they just went a little bit too far. And they said, we need to circle the wagons and, and cut ourselves off from the world. We need to get as far away from the Babylonians as possible. Don't even speak to them. Don't even look at them. We had to maintain our holiness and not interfere with Babylon at all. And it's it sounds pretty spiritual, doesn't it, at the first glance? You know, keep your distance from the pagans. Don't want to get infected by them. Don't even speak to them. It's a kind of, a kind of um, Amish approach. You see the Amish eh, and they kind of just fully retreat from society. They shut the gates, they lock the doors and they say, if we can just keep away from the pagans for long enough, Jesus will come back and we don't have to worry about anything. Some were saying compromise, some were saying hide in the bush. And isn't it true, brothers and sisters, we see the same voices today in the church? We see some who said, let's conform ourselves to the world. Let's just be like the world as much as possible. We don't need to be so different. We don't want them to think we're weird after all. So let's just become as like them as we can. Let's blur the lines and the distinctions and hopefully they'll accept us eventually if we do this. And then other people are saying, get out of here. Get as far as you can from civilization and start your doomsday preparations as we saw in First Peter. There's some Christians saying these things, isn't it? I hope you've got your water supply. I hope you've been, been drying out your food in jars. Right at the other end of the spectrum, we hear these voices even in the church today. Some saying compromise, some saying cut off from the world. But what does God say? He says, he says, don't pay attention to either of them. Look at verse eight. It says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie, a lie which they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. And isn't it true the world is full of prophets now? There's social media, there's all sorts of advice, there's all sorts of different TED Talks for your problems. God says, don't listen to any of it. If it's not lining up with the word, it's lies. You must test everything against the voice of the scriptures. Don't listen to the voices of culture. Don't even listen to your minister if he's not preaching the gospel. Test everything against, against, the, very, against the very word of God. Listen to the voice of the shepherd. He said, okay, then don't listen to the extremists on the one side. Don't listen to the extremists on the other side. What is it that God wants us to be doing? 
Well, take a look at verse five. It says, here it is, revolutionary. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. In other words, take a long view of life. You know, when I went to the General Assembly, wouldn't it have been strange to find me um, planting a few kumaras in the garden? If I was there plowing the soil, people would think, what's happened? Has he gone mad? He's only here for four days. But if you're staying somewhere for longer, you begin to, to make preparations, don't you? God says, take a long view. You might be here a short time. Christ might return. You might be here a long time. Make sure there's oil in your lamps. Take the, take the long view because we could be here for a while. You need to, to live. You need to be in the world, but not of it. Put down roots, build houses, plant gardens. Act in a way as if you were staying here for a long time. It might not be true. The Lord might return, but take the long view. That's why we have Bible colleges, isn't it? And things like this. And there's no need to train the next generation for ministry if we say that Christ is going to come back any second. But God says, take the long view. Train the next generation. Act as if you might be here for a long time, even though you might not. Build houses, plant gardens, eat their produce. Get married and have children, verse 6. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give, give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. M multiply there and do not decrease. In other words, enjoy the good things that God has given. And what does the world say today? It says it's a selfish choice to bring children into this world. Have you ever heard that said? That don't bring children into this since it world. And here God says the opposite, doesn't he? He says, if it's possible for you, have children and give them to one another within the covenant community. Don't give them to the pagans. Marry them to other Christians. Spread the kingdom the old-fashioned way. This is the voice of God, isn't it? Don't reject the good gifts of marriage and children. God says to be fruitful and multiply wherever that's possible. If you can't have kids, consider adoption. If you can't adopt, it's not the right time for your family. So spiritually into the children of the church. And none of us get to escape from this child-rearing aspect of the covenant community, do we? You know, the Africans say it takes a village to, to raise a child. And that's true, isn't it? All of us can be spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers in the church. If you see my kids running wild, feel free to give them a clip around the ear. I said that, is Jacob around? I said that, Jacob. Watch out. Yeah. Be fathers and, and, fathers and mothers in the church. This is part of God's plan, isn't it? Do not, do not decrease. Don't say we're not going to have kids because the world's evil, because the light shines through the gospel and God is often faithful to families, isn't he? Do not decrease. And they're listening to Dr. Gomez speak about these things. He's like an expert on culture and epistemology and this sort of thing. And he's not a tinfoil hat guy, but he was saying that there is a, a plan to depopulate the earth. Sounds a bit tinfoil hat, but he says this is the curse. He says it's kind of what the LGBTQ stuff's about. It's not really about the sexual aspect of it, the pleasure. It's about let's just stop people breeding. Let's just, let's just calm things down on that front. It says here, now take the long view of life, have kids, raise them, give them to other Christian families, raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That, and does it say to escape from the city? No, it doesn't look at verse seven. It says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. I don't like the word welfare there. Some versions say, seek the peace of the city. That might be in your Bible. And I think that's more accurate. Seek the peace of the city. What's that mean? Well, of course, it means that we need to have Christians in, in politics. We need to have Christian politicians and governors who can give godly wisdom and can tell people this is what the Lord says in his word. Uh, but seeking the peace of the city is much more than that. How do we most fundamentally seek the peace of the city? 
It's by preaching the gospel to our city. Because until there's peace between God and man, there is no peace. That's why we go out and share the good news. We say you must surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the true king of the city. He's the ruler, the potentate, the God of Gisborne. And you must submit to him. Seek the peace of the city. Point people to Christ and say you must come to him. And what will be the effect? It says, in its peace, you will find peace. And do you know that if our government was converted, we'd have a better country? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? But if we used God's wisdom, do you think the world would run a little bit smoother? It definitely would, wouldn't it? How's that going to happen? It's, it's through them hearing the gospel and being converted and working out the principles of Christianity in their life. Seek the peace of the city. We can't escape from the city. We live here, don't we? I mean, some of us live a bit further afield, but you still can't really escape it. You've still got to come to pack and save to get your shopping, even if you live up the coast. Now, seek the peace of the city. Be engaged in the town, preaching the good news, seeking to bring the wisdom of God into society. Seek the surrender of the city and the peace of the gospel. So it's not really that flash what God tells us to do, is it? Some people say, is this it? Are these our instructions? Have families, be families to one another, pray for the peace of the city, plant some trees. It's simple stuff, isn't it? But we need the reminder because we go off to these extremes. We go into fear and want to retreat from the world or we become just like the world. But in fact, we're called to be in the world but not of it. So I'm sorry if you wanted to escape the world, but that's not God's will for you. What did Jesus say in John 17? He said, Father, I'm not, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you sanctify them through the truth. I definitely go to that and I'd love to be taken out of this world. I've had enough. But it's not God's will, is it? We must see the peace of the city. We must be Christians in this time. As we do this, as we follow God's blueprint, it says it will bless us, it will bless our city. This is our purpose in the world, to bring sinners to Christ and to watch the gospel spread through families, through churches, and through the means of grace he's appointed. And so you can imagine, can't you? Jeremiah said this. He's given them this holy task to carry on being the people of God. And some people just say, well, I want to, but I'm surrounded by all these pagans. I need some encouragement. What have you got for me, Jeremiah? And thankfully in the passage, there are some promises that Jeremiah gives. And this will be our third point today. We've seen a people in exile. We've seen a purpose in ex exile. Now let's look together at a promise in exile. A promise in in exile. So if I was to say to you this morning, I'm going to preach on Jeremiah 29, you'd have been thinking, ah, yes, those famous verses, we all know this little bit, don't we? Verses 10 to 14, let me read it to us. For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill my promise and bring you back to this place. And here's the super famous one, you've probably got it on the front of your Bible. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will come, call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all, all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. There's tons to unpack there, isn't there? The first encouragement for the people of God is that your exile is not forever. Isn't that great that we won't be in this world forever? We won't be in the wilderness forever. The wilderness takes us to the promised land. God is going to visit us and bring us home. Verse 10, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to the place. It's great encouragement for Israel, but what about for you and me? We see an even greater land, don't we? The new Jerusalem. God's not going to just bring his people back physically to the land, the Jew, which he will in the last days. 
He's going to bring all his people to the new Jerusalem, to the heaven above, which is our mother. It's going to be glorious. We're going back to God's presence. Great encouragement. What did Jesus say in John 14? He said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house and many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself. Our exile's going to end and God's going to bring us home. Could have, been, could have been 70 years, could have been 700 years, we don't know. But the time will come. He will bring us all home. The exile will end and we'll all be going home. How can we be so sure? Because the second encouragement, God knows the plans he has for us. Verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. It's a verse which is used evangelistically, but it's nothing to do with the unbeliever at all, is it? God has no plans for the unbeliever except, except to send them to hell if they don't turn to Christ. There's no plans whatsoever until you come to the gospel. There's no encouragement here for the unbeliever. God's talking to the people of God. He's saying, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, speaking to God's people. He knows the plans he has for us. You know, in the letter to the seven churches, when Jesus is writing to the churches, he keeps saying, I know, I know, I know. He knows. He knows the plans he has for you, for me, for our children, for everyone in this room. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows your struggle. He knows what it's like to be in exile. Don't forget he went himself from the halls of heaven to the damnation of the cross. He knows what it is to be an exile, to be despised and rejected by men. He knows the struggle, yet he knows the promise. He knows that even these things won't stop God's purpose in our lives. He's given us a hope, the hope of sanctification now in this world, the hope of glory in the next. He's given to us a future, a future not only with him in heaven, but a future for his church. What did God say? He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. His purposes will come to pass for Grace Church Gisborne, for all the churches in Gisborne, for all the churches across the entire world. It will come to pass. Listen to this promise from, from Micah chapter four. He said, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, come, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And you know this passage well, the plow, plowshares will be beaten into pruning hooks and the nations will not learn war anymore. These are great things which God has planned for his church. It will grow, it will conquer and we'll be a part of it. The third encouragement he gives is that he will hear our prayers and answer them. And when the exile's finished, God will answer all your questions. Did you know that? Verse 12. So then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And that's true today that God hears your prayers and answers them. We have a, a greater access even than the Old Testament saints. And but in heaven, Christ will answer all our questions. He'll reveal to us the why of the exile. Why was I placed here at this time? Why did I go through this struggle? What, where were you, Lord? He'll reveal all of it to us. You won't have any more questions in heaven because Christ will answer all our questions. He'll reveal it. He'll make it known. For now, the hidden purposes of God, we can't figure them out. But in heaven, he'll disclose his heart to us. He'll show us the reason for all our trials, all our tribulation, and for all the hard things we faced in exile. The fourth and final encouragement, 
He will restore our souls. Look at verse, um, verse 14 there. It says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you back from all the nations and the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. You know, all that beautiful stuff you read in the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation with the tree of life and all those things we thought about last week. That's where God is taking us. Again, we'll walk with him in the cool of the day, face-to-face fellowship. He'll restore us. He'll mend our broken spirits. He will bring us back in from the place in which he sent us now into exile. Uh, Thomas Brooks, the Puritan, put it this way. He says, heaven shall be, the, shall be the restoration of all our losses, the reparation of all our damages, and the recovery of all our worse, the restoration of all our decays. In heaven, all tears shall be wiped away from our eyes, all sorrow shall be banished from our hearts, and all trouble shall be excluded from our presence. The glory of heaven shall be the full repair of the breaches made by sin. It isn't forever, he will bring us back. And these promises are the things which sustain us as we go. You know, when you go on a long walk and you take the water for the journey, it refreshes you, it sustains you. Well, that's what God's promises are meant to be for you and me. He knows the plans he has for us to give us a hope and a future. He will restore our souls. The exile will not be forever. Until then, we go forward with the simple things having houses, having families, going forth, loving one another, being the people of God. Let's ask a few questions as we close this morning. Well, it's been great to come to God's word and to hear his promises once again, and to hear the reality that we are a people in exile. A, a, a people in exile. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you this morning, if you come to accept this reality, Do you know that you're a pilgrim here, a foreigner, an exile in your own homeland? Because your true home is in heaven. Don't be surprised when you don't fit in. Don't be surprised when you struggle here because you were built for another world. You were made for the presence of God. It's part of the reason we struggle so much. And yes, not without purpose, is it? Because who put you in exile? It was God himself, wasn't it? He allowed all this to happen because of his sovereignty, because of his plan for good. And he will bring a people back to himself. Till then, we've been been left here for such a time as this. A time, as I've joked before, when men think they're cats and dogs, when people don't know what a woman is. All this kind of madness, this is the time God places in. We're here in exile, but we've been given a purpose in exile. We're still to take the long view. Christ might come back in a thousand years from now, who knows? We don't know when he's coming, but we need to be watchful, just as the parable of the ten virgins teaches us. We're to take the long view, we're to build, we're to sow into our community. And with these means of grace that God has given us, we're to seek the peace of the city, a peace which only comes through the gospel. We're not to retreat from the world. We're not to become like the world. We're to be in the world, but not of it. How does Peter put it in his epistle? He says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, not the fear of man, but the fear of God. And know that you are ransomed from the futile wares inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. The blood is, which is like a lamb without blemish or spot. Conduct yourselves with the fear of God throughout the time of your exile. Right in the midst of the conflict, right in the enemy's camp, go forward with his promises. He knows the plans he has for us. He's sovereign over those plans and he'll bring them to pass. If not in our lifetime, then in the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren. Even after we die, God's still going to be working things for his glory. It will come to pass that the mountain of the Lord will rise and be the highest of all mountains and the nations will flow to it. 
So how can we take the harp off the willow? How can we sing a song in a foreign land? It's by remembering all this stuff, isn't it? It's by the promises of God, remembering it's not forever, remembering our King is coming. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Do you have that hope this morning? Are you a Christian? If not, then come to Christ. Ask him to forgive you for your sins. You'll be part of that people of God and God will have some amazing plans for your life. But his plan for you today is to repent and believe the gospel. If you're not a Christian, do that this morning. If you are a believer, look forward to what God has planned for you and conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Amen.